But while you find your seat, I, I want to say this. I, uh, I, I told our crew tonight, I said, they don't need me here at this church. You see, I go places all over the world where they're not used to things like this. And so I'm forced into a kind of a ministry mold to kind of challenge people and kind of instruct people and then show them. But you don't need me here for that tonight. I'm telling you, God is in this house, ladies and gentlemen. The Lord is in this house. And so, really, I, I'm just going to share my heart for a few moments. I'm not going to preach some big, long, bombastic message. And we'll just let this worship team pick back up. Because I'm telling you, God's doing something. And I don't want to interfere. But there's sometimes when I'll come to a service, much like this one, and even times at our church where... Even on a Wednesday, I haven't even preached because I feel like I would be getting in the way of what the glory of the Lord yeah. is doing. And a lot of people, you know, they'll read that Old Testament passage there where Uso reached over and he touched the Ark of the Covenant. And remember, God killed him. Yeah. And everybody's like, holy smokes, why would God do that? I'll tell you why. Because you are never allowed to put your fingerprints on the glory of God. And so sometimes if a preacher's not careful, he can get in a service like this and then all of a sudden get up and, and squelch yeah. what the yeah. Lord's doing. I don't want to do that. I want the Lord to have his way in this house tonight because I don't believe he's done. I believe God wants to continue Amen. to yeah. do things in people's hearts. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna mind the Lord and I'm gonna I'm gonna preach for a few moments, maybe, from Mark chapter number five. But as I'm doing that, I'm just gonna listen to what the Lord says. When God says we're done, we're going back into some altars, I think. Mean, you know, you still need to get right. And I tell our folks at Global Vision with the Big Ten all the time, there is no protocol, it's full-time altar call, right? You don't have to wait until a man or a woman's done preaching to get right with God. You can get right with God at any moment in this service. You can deliver us, healing, salvation, baptism of the Holy Spirit, all at one time and at any time. Amen? Now look, I understand that God dwells everywhere at once. We understand the glory of God. We understand the eternal presence of the Lord. But you listen to me. The God that dwells everywhere desires to dwell somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Now listen to me. I'm going to share something with you. And wherever we are, Alabama. Okay? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Okay, this is Poke Plum Town. You poke dinner in the corner. You plum out town. Now listen. I'll tell you something about Mulga, Alabama. Never been here, never been to this church. I know my wife's preached here, my daughter's preached here, yes, my son's idea. coming, Pastor Jesse's been here. So yeah. like, everybody in the church has been here except me, so I'm glad to be here. But oh, listen, I go a lot of places. And I'm talking about a lot of places. Big, small, regular, black and white, tall, short, fat, skinny, hairy, head and bald, Baptist, Pentecostal, oh, church of God, you name it, right? Uh, quite the church mouse, running the aisles, the whole deal. I've been everywhere. And listen to me, and listen to me well. There are very few places I have ever been in 31 years of ministry that is as free as this building right here. Praise the Lord! It's important for you to hear from an outside perspective. Okay? Because here's what happens. We've been in full-blown revival in our church for four years. Full-blown revival. We've baptized 12,000 converts since COVID happened. Amen. And so we, deliverance broke out, you know, movie, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's not about movies. It's about a movement. Yeah. Yeah. And you guys and gals are right slap dab in the middle of a Holy Ghost movement. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to tell you something from the perspective of somebody that has studied revival and has had the privilege to lead one now in our church for four years, and that is this. If you are not careful, you will get comfortable around what it, God is doing, and you'll take it for granted. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. No, I, I don't care which ministry you're from. I don't care if you go here full time or every now and again. Do not discount what the Lord is doing in this house. Okay? Amen. Amen. It's amazing. I know for some of you it's a little wild, it's a little crazy. You're like, holy smokes. I've never been in church like this. I get people all the time like, I don't know if I can ever go to a church where demons scream. I'm like, I don't think I can ever go to a church where demons don't no, scream. Amen. These preachers get mad. I'm like, I was watching your live stream last week. And I'm like, you hate my guts. Why are you even watching the live yeah. stream? I'm like, I'm like a bad car accident. They can't turn their face away. And they're like, we heard somebody screaming out a demon right in the middle of your message. And we just don't know what to think about that. I'm like, look, I'm sorry. You don't have enough anointing from the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Come on. Demon, man, when you're yeah. You preach Jesus. And you're not going to have this in the fear of God. Yeah. You don't know you have authority over demons. Yeah. Not the other way around. Right? Yeah. And so, listen, gone are the days when 
services are one hour in length and they're dry as cracker juice. Gone on those days. Listen, there's not a church in America, and I preach in a bunch of them, there's not a church in America that's having revival that has 60 minute church services. Come on. Come on. Bunch of robots, we gotta come in, we gotta come in, we gotta come in, we gotta go out, we don't want to stand, we don't want to sit, we don't want to give. Come on, brother. And we have church whether God shows up or not. That's nonsense. Amen. We're so worried about being the Methodist to the Chinese book. Oh. Get a flippant attitude about the things of God. Mm, come on. And we get to a place where we're like, well, you know, it's just always going to be like that. Let me say something. It is not always like this. Amen. 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 It is not always like this. That's right. So I, I want to just say, I'm still kind of introducing some things before I get to the text, if I even get to the text. All right, but listen to me. I, I want to share from, from our vantage point uh, as a deliverance ministry. And, and by the way, Deliverance is not who you are. Deliverance is what you do as a reflection of who you are. Who you are are gospel soldiers. Amen. 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 You are preachers of the gospel. You are yeah. kingdom-minded individuals. And deliverance just happens to happen because we are kingdom-minded. Because Amen. in my name you shall cast out devils. That's the first thing I saw when the Holy Spirit of God comes upon us. Yeah. And you better know that in the last days, saying, God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That's right. That's right. And I don't know what kind of denomination you're from, what kind of church you came from, how you grew up, and what your religion is, but you hear me, God doesn't need your permission to send revival. Come on. God doesn't need a bossy deacon board to say you can do this and you can't do that. God doesn't care. The only board in the Bible is that one Paul floated on when he prayed in Acts chapter 20. And so if we're not careful, we will ruin a work of the Lord because we will infiltrate it with our ideas of controlling it. Yeah. Amen. Like, well, you know, we don't want any wildfire to break out. Listen, don't worry about wildfire. There's enough wet blankets around for that real quick. Yeah. 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 There's enough Debbie Downers. There's yeah. enough yeah. individuals. There's enough people on. like, oh, that can't be real. That's not really a demon. Oh, oh they didn't really have cancer. They didn't get out of that wheelchair. Oh, Their marriage wasn't yeah. really that bad. There'll always be doubters. Yeah. But don't be the doubters. Be the shouters. Amen. Yeah. 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 Celebrate what God's doing in this house. Not doing it everywhere. Amen. Come on. Amen. I go some places, it's like preaching in a lunch sack. You just you can't even move. There's just no movement. It's just constriction, that python spirit, that religious spirit. Yeah. There's an overshadowing in the room. You can sense it when you walk in, you can sense it when you walk out. It's like preaching in molasses. Yeah. And I've been, by the way, I pastored a church like that for a long time. Come on. Man, we were just dry and boring. Oh, how I love you. Drag in and drag out. No excitement. And I'm thinking to myself, my goodness, I hope nobody gets saved today because the service might go too long. Oh, and somebody might complain. Oh, and of on. course, how many of you grew up Baptist? I'm not against Baptist, but how many of you grew up Baptist? All right, cool. How many you still Baptist? And that's okay. That's not a true question. Okay, one of the first time. You remember the bulletins in the Baptist churches? You can't do anything without a bulletin, right? Because the bulletin tells you what you're going to see, when you're going to see, how you're going to stand, when you're going to sit. And, you know, there's four verses to every song, but if you sing the third verse, that throws a monkey wrench in the whole thing, right? And so I grew up denominationally believing, theoretically, that God can still work, but practically never seeing Him do yeah. it. And so the danger in a movement like this is you can just expect it in every service and say, well, just case of rah, rah, it's no big deal. Let me tell you, yeah. what's happening in this house is a big deal. Yeah. 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 And I honor this house and honor this man and woman of God and honor the, the volunteers and the, the worship team and the leadership and, and everybody that's here tonight from, from a different ministry. I, I honor you because I'm telling you, God is doing something. And, and I don't know what anybody's ever told you. It doesn't matter. It's the first time I've ever been here. Listen to me. This is not the end of what God is doing. This is barely Trust you with something big. Come on. Despise not the day of small things. Because small stuff grows up. 
Yeah. And God is checking the level of your trustability. Does that make sense? Let's make yeah. that word up, but I like it. <laughs> make up a lot of words. Listen to me. God is not looking for a church that he can bless. He is looking for a church that he can trust. Now, they're not bad. They've got to leave, so it's all right. I guess I understand that. So they're not upset. But he's looking for a church that he can trust. Because what happens when God trusts you yeah. is God will bless you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Revival is a stewardship from the Lord. If you steward it well, then it skids off. He will crank up the power and the presence of the Lord, and you will experience more than you ever imagined. If you believe that, would you shout hallelujah? Amen. Now, let, let me say this to the people that come here on a regular basis. All right? I, I don't know you from Adam's house camp, but I'm going to tell you something, and, and I want to help you. Listen. One of the things that, and, and just keep on ministering, that don't bother me one bit. We have it every, every service in our place. One of the things that you're going to need to guard against is a lack of the discerning of spirits. Yeah, come on. I'll tell you why. In an atmosphere like this that is supercharged with deliverance, okay? I'll tell you something. The spirit of divination blends in very well. Come on. And we found out the hard way that witches' covenants will find a church like this and they will try their best to infiltrate, distract, and disparagingly derail the leadership. I'm telling you, I don't know if you've experienced it yet. And yes, we love witches and we want them to get born again. But listen, in an atmosphere like this, witches will do their best to put themselves on the prayer team. Yeah, come on. Be careful. Amen. Okay, everybody all right? Yeah. 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 Y'all shouting like that crazy. Oh, come come on. on. Oh, don't we see it? I tell you, be careful. Yeah. We have had witches come in. They seem like the most spiritual people yeah. in the world. You would think, dear God, she could be a wonderful librarian. Yeah. She's so quiet. She's so stately. Yeah. She's so wonderful. And without the discerning of spirit, you'll put her over the prayer team and she'll ruin the whole church in 15 days. Yeah. I'm telling you, in an atmosphere like this, God is pleased and the devil is ticked. The devil is sending in his best soldiers. Because, get this, it's not about mega church. It's about churches with a mega God. Okay? Because of that fact, the devil is going to fight this congregation different than he fights other congregations. That's right, man. That's right. It's just facts. Because you know he schemes. You know what he's doing, right? You know the dreams and plans and goals of the enemy. And so you're out ahead of him. So the enemy is going to come against this church in ways the average church don't understand. So even if it's a pastor friend of yours or it's the church you grew up in or if your parents always want to talk to you about that crazy charismatic church that you go to, look, you no longer have to do your best to defend yourself because if people aren't here, they will never be able to understand what God's doing because they operate in a context where God's not doing it. Does that make sense? Amen. And so I, I humbly say to you, thank God for what the Lord is doing in this house. Amen. Do not take it for granted. Amen. It's not going to be easy. There's going to be a lot of spiritual bloodshed and warfare, but just get up, wipe the blood out of your nose, and Paul used to say, rub some dirt in it, because the best players play hurt. Just get up and keep going. Amen. Just get up and keep going. Get behind the man of God, honor the man of God, honor this house, and I'm telling you what the Lord is going to do with this place is truly fantastical. Amen. Truly Unbelievable. Well, all, right, all of that to say, I'm going to give you just a couple of verses in Mark chapter 5. Many of you know the story of what's happening, and so uh, we're not going to take a long time to drill down into the context because, again, I believe the Lord wants to do some stuff in this house. But there is a woman here in Mark chapter number 5, in verse number 25, it says, And a certain woman which had an issue of blood for 12 years, and she suffered many things of many physicians, and she spent all that she had. And she was nothing the better, but rather she grew worse. Now, let me say a couple of things about this. Jesus, in Mark chapter 5, has proved himself to be powerfully sovereign over three different situations in one chapter. Not one book, one chapter. He proves himself to be sovereign over demons, over disease, 
and over death. Yes. So you need to understand that 2,000 years later, Jesus is still sovereign and powerful over demons, over disease, and over death, right? Yes. Yes. Very much. Because God not changed, and Titus 1 2 says God cannot lie. So in this context, while Jesus is ministering to the multitudes, he is on his way to the home of a man named Jairus, whose daughter is in bed and she's dying. Now, eventually Jesus is going to resurrect her from the dead. And so, while he is walking to the man's house, this woman shows up. Now, here's what's interesting about this woman. Right? Just give me a little volume and we'll just let her keep on going. I'll do one thing. Here's what's interesting about this woman. The Bible never gives her a name. Come on. But it does give her an identification. Yes. Come on with The Bible says that it was a woman with an issue of blood yeah. for 12 years. Yeah. Now, sometimes you can learn what the Bible teaches us by what it doesn't say as much as by what it does say. Yeah. So it doesn't say, you know, Sheila, Melissa, Tiffany, Shaniqua, any of these things, right? No. It says she was a woman. Yeah. But then here's how the Holy Spirit identifies her. It was a woman with the issue. You see, I find it important, especially in a meeting and a move like this tonight, that you understand that if you are not careful, you will get to a place in your life where the issues that you struggle with will hijack your identity and you will wake up one day not knowing who you are because you will identify yourself by the addiction that you have, by the people that you have.
Now, men, we do not get our connectivity as far as our identity through relationships. We get it through hard work and success. And so that's why you can take a man who has a good job, but if he loses that job, not wanting to lose that job, he's proud of himself, making money, he's successful, you know, he's, he's paying the bills, he's supporting his family, and then he loses his job. And what happens? He finds himself in the front seat of a pickup truck with a pistol slap at the end of the dirt road because his identity was wrapped up in his job. And so we all get our identity in different ways. But you have to understand tonight that the church in America is an identity crisis. Because your identity does not come through the church you go to. Your identity does not come through deliverance. Your identity does not come through what you did, who you are, what your addiction is. If you're single, married, divorced, yada, yada, yada. Your identity is solely fixed in the fact that you are sons and daughters of the living God. We are sitting with Christ in heaven. And for a guy like me, that's helpful. Because if you want to know something about Greg Law, don't Google me. Okay, just come. You're like, man, I read this on Google. Well, Google also says men can get pregnant, so take that into consideration. So please understand that at the end of the day, if you are not careful, you will begin to identify yourself by what other people place on you rather than what God has placed within you. That makes you say so here's a woman with an issue of blood. Now, in order to have an issue of blood in the Bible, you're talking about something that we would look at as like leprosy, HIV. I mean, you talk about quarantine. A blood disease in the Bible was a big deal. This woman was not allowed to be around family, friends. She is ostracized. She has been isolated. She has been separated from the rest of the community. And when she finds out that Jesus is coming to town, the Bible says that she says within herself, if I can only touch the heel of his garment, I shall be whole. To explain yeah. that it's not like she opened up her Twitter account that morning and you know said, Oh, you know what? If I go touch this man Jesus, according to this tweet that I read, I'll be made whole. She didn't have Facebook, wasn't no Snapchat, wasn't no TikTok, none of that, right? So she finds out that this miracle working man, this delivering Messiah, has come to her town. Which by the way, he had been there before. That's why she knew yeah. that what he had done had worked. Because the people, of course, he was saved, still healed, still delivered, the whole thing. So he comes back for a secondary occasion. She finds out about it and she says, Holy smokes, if I can just touch that man's yeah. clothing, I will be made whole. Yeah. Yeah. Now you'll notice that when she came in, we're not going to go verse by verse. We don't need to do that. It's right there in the text. You can see. Yeah. You'll notice that when she touches, that she doesn't shake his hand. He doesn't sign her Bible. Yeah, come on. He don't pat her on the head. And she don't give him a hug. None of that's wrong, but the Bible says that she touched the hymn like yeah. a dog. Like an animal, she crawled in to the presence of Jesus and touched the hem of his garment. You can imagine everybody's like, here's this woman with the issue. You see, not only did the Holy Spirit tell us that, that's the only way the people in the community knew her. Oh, there's that woman with the blood issue. What are you doing here, woman? But there's that woman that's broke as a joke. She's been to all the doctors and she's no better. She's been to all the preachers and she's no better. Miracle. 
So the Bible says that she felt in her body that she had been healed of this plague. Yeah. But here's something super, super interesting. We, we, we never really like to talk about this particular part of the text. But listen to what the Bible says. He looks at her straightway, verse 29. The fountain of her blood was dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. Jesus, knowing in himself, first she went out. He turned and said, who touched my clothes? Yeah. And by the way, that was a loaded question. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody was touching his clothes. Amen. Amen. It was like a stomp handbed. They were all over the place. Yeah. Right? And so he wasn't asking because he needed to know. He was asking because we needed to know. That's yeah. right. That's right. right. That's and so the disciples said, thou seest the multitude thronging thee. Thou seest who touched me. And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. Watch this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. Yeah, yeah. That's good. He said, who touched me? Turned around, looked around in her eyes, and she said, it was me. I got to tell you why. I got to tell you why I'm here. I got to tell you the whole deal. And she just began to regurgitate her whole story. Yeah. And I'll tell you something. Don't discount the fact that God's given you a story. Amen. Amen. Come on. Praise God. Come on. His story. Amen. His glory. Amen. Siamese twins and don't let anybody talk you out of what you know God Amen. You see, they can argue with you theologically. People can say, well, I don't believe in demons. I don't believe in angels. I don't believe in deliverance. I don't believe in healing. I don't believe in tongues. I don't believe in whatever, whatever, whatever. That's fine. They can argue. But let me tell you one thing they can't argue with. What you know the Holy Ghost did for you. So she knew it. But then watch it. And he, Jesus, said unto her. Now wait a minute. Who's her? The woman. Three times she's been called woman with the issue. Her identity was wrapped up in her issue. Her issue was who she was. That's why her name didn't matter. Come on. Because she wasn't living up to her name. She was living out her issue. Yeah. Amen. She was living out the sickness, the disease. She was living out the, the addiction, the yeah. handicap, whatever. She was living out the illusion of this identity crisis in her life until yeah. she had Jesus. That's right. Because up until that point, woman, 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 issue, issue, issue. Yeah. Yep. But check this out. And Jesus said of her, watch this one word that falls out of his mouth. Daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. He gave her yeah. identity. What she had been looking for for a dozen years. Come on, brother. Amen. And it wasn't a blood transfusion. Come no. on. It wasn't just mere healing in her body. It was healing of her soul wounds. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because what she really wanted was to know who she was. Amen. Yeah. 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 That's right. And Jesus turns, and of all the things he says, and of all the ways he could have addressed this woman, the first red letter word out of his mouth to her face in front of everyone was simply, Daughter. Yeah. Come on. And some of you need to understand tonight that God knows exactly who you are. Yeah. Amen. You see, the world and the enemy knows your name. Yep. But they call you by your issue. Oh, come on, brother. God knows your issues, but he calls you by your name. Amen. Because you are not who he said you are. That's right. You are not who she said you are. Come on, brother. Pray. You know, some of you will get deliverance that fast when you break the soul tie with a narcissistic relationship That's that you right. have. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Right. Come on. Right. It's a fact. Yeah. Right. Narcissism is a demon. Yeah. 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 And if you've never been in a relationship like that, probably you don't know how much of a demon that crazy thing is. Yeah. 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 Some of you have been so beat down. You hear me preach right now. You're like, I don't even know who I am anymore. I'm, I'm out. I can't figure out why I've got this addiction, why I've got this struggle. I feel stuff moving around. I can't sleep at night. I got nightmares. I got panic attacks. Yada, yada, whatever, whatever. Oh. I'm here to tell you, the devil has stolen your identity. Yeah. Amen. And tonight, here's what Jesus says. Come. Yeah. So, child of the living God. Right. Yeah. And of all the things Jesus could have done, he simply spoke identity into a woman that desperately needed it. Amen. That's why this generation is both wild and crazy. Yeah. By the way, when, when they get on fire, woo! Amen. Amen. Them chokers on fire. Yeah. And they'll go bear hunting with a switch. 
such an identity crisis if you don't reach them that right. way, they go their whole life That's looking right. for themselves. Come on. Right. Right. Trying to find who am I, 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 because the world is very good at telling you who they want you to be. Yeah. Yeah. There's always a King Saul that'll put their armor on you to go fight battles that you're called to fight, but you're not called to fight your battle their way. Yeah. Their armor don't fit you, and they can figure that out. Does that make sense? Yeah. In the bondage of an identity crisis because you're trying to wear all the things everybody else put on you. Yeah, that's right. Mm, come on. You're so busy trying to be who your mama said you are, who your daddy said you are. Come on. You know, well, there's a lot of preachers in the American culture that go up like a rocket and come down like a meteorite because their mama called and daddy sent. Yeah, mm. that's right. They're not Holy Ghost called and kingdom sent. Amen. And there's a lot of people that live their whole life based off what their mama thinks, what their in-laws think, <laughs> what their kids think, what their parents think, what whoever thinks, what their preacher thinks. Yeah. And they live their whole life with what I call that disease to please. Yeah. And God said, oh, no, 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 let me give you some identity tonight. He looked at this woman and said, daughter. Yeah. First word out of his mouth. Daughter. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You see, of course she wanted healing. She was pain, in pain. She hurt. I mean, 12 years of hemorrhaging blood, you're pretty weak at that moment. Yeah. yeah. You're pretty skinny, sickly, anemic, can't hold food down, crawling around like an animal, yeah. eyes sucking back in your head. You, you can imagine with all of that internal bleeding, what that does, and how all of that just intertwines one problem to the next, to the next, this infirmity, this horrible spirit that had been upon her for a dozen years. Yeah, come on. And you would think that that's the number one thing she needed. But Jesus knew it was secondary to what she really needed. Come on. Because some of you, if I can say it this way, I'm not trying to sound spooky, I'm just telling you the truth. Your body would come into alignment if your spirit was healed. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's right. If, if your heart was healed, your body would follow just fine. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the things we find, I'm talking about deliverance ministry, you know, one of the things we find in deliverance ministry amongst a thousand things. But one of the most interesting things is the connection between rheumatoid arthritis and unforgiveness. Wow. Mm. Wow. You know, Proverbs says, bitterness will rot in your bones. Yes. Amen. That's a scientific process, that's a biblical accuracy, right? Yeah. And people are like, oh man, my knuckles are swollen, I can't hardly walk, my knees are all swollen up. Man, I'm telling you, I got all this rheumatoid arthritis. What do you think it is? I think you need to forgive your daddy, is what I think you need yeah. to do. I think you need to forgive your ex. I think you need to forgive your mama. I think you need to forgive yourself. Yes. Yeah. And I've watched the swelling in people's joints go down before my very eyes when they simply offered forgiveness. Because listen to me, what you will learn in a, in a red hot Holy Ghost deliverance field church like this is nine times out of ten, it's not what people are eating that's killing them. Yeah. It's what's eating on those people that's yeah. killing them. Amen. 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 It's the facts. And Jesus understood the reality that her physical condition was not the real malady and illness in the problem. It was her soul. Yeah. Come on. And he said, daughter. And man, she perked up like a coffee pot. Yeah. <laughs> because at that moment, she got what 12 years of pain couldn't give her. Come on. You know, before we found, I say we found, the deliverance ministry just showed up at the door one day. Amen. <laughs> That's what it does. Okay? Then you can't put it back in the box. <laughs> but before deliverance ministry, by the power of God, found us, uh, I went through three and a half years of unbelievable chronic depression as the pastor of Global Vision. I mean, it was pre fivefold spirit field. I mean, I, I get it. But I, I still had a lot of religion in me and on me. But I, I went through three and a half years of horrid. Panic attacks. You ever been to the hospital for a panic attack? I've had two my whole life. I'm almost, uh, I'm 60, almost 40 years ago. I'm almost 50. But the truth is, I've had two panic attacks in 48 years. It feels like you're getting kicked in the chest by a mule. I never tried to the hospital. And, and I, was, I was going through these horrible panic attacks. As the pastor of our church, I'd get up on Monday, on Sunday, preach, 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 go home, go to bed, couldn't get out of bed for two or three days. And I was like, what in the world? A little known fact, it's the reason in 2013 I started riding bicycles. Because my mind was going crazy. And I thought, man, I've got to have something. Jesus saved my soul, but i got to have something going to save my mind. I'm about to go crazy. So I got on a bicycle and started riding you know, all over the place. And so 
I didn't understand then the connection to what I know now, but I lost myself for three and a half years as the pastor of a church. Yeah. I lost myself to an identity crisis of depression. Because look, I came from a denomination that said, oh, a Christian can never have depression. Come on. The same people that say Christians can never have a demon. But a Christian can never have anxiety. A Christian can't have a panic attack. A Christian can have anything they want. Amen. Anything they want. And so I would get up and look in the mirror, try to shave, and I, I didn't even know myself anymore. I was pastor and at that day, it was much smaller, but relatively successful church, and God was doing some great things in our in our church. But I had lost myself to depression because all I ever heard was, you know, if you just go to church and read your Bible, you'll never have depression, you'll never have anxiety. And the more I went to church and preached and read the Bible, the worse it got. Yeah, come on. But then I found out one day, Isaiah 61 and verse 4, what depression is. The spirit of heaviness. Yeah. <clears throat> and when I was able to identify what it was, it gave me my identity back because it was no longer who I was. Come it was just on. what I struggled with. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 And so this woman immediately received from the Lord actually what she needed. And that was the fact that she needed to know who she was. And he simply said, daughter. And then listen. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Say the word whole. Whole. Say it again. Whole. Think about that for a moment. This is important. He did not say, your faith has made you healed. Come on. All the way did. Right. He said, your faith has made you whole. Why? Because there's a lot of people that are seeking healing. Yeah. But not wholeness. Come on. Come on. You can be healed from a sickness. Yeah. But not made whole in your heart. That's right. Not made whole in your relationships or your yes. marriage. Yeah. You can be healed from an addiction, but not made whole to never again go back to that. Addiction. That's right. And Jesus didn't just say, You got your healing. He said, No, ma'am, because I gave you identity, I fixed those soul ties and those soul wounds, yes. that crushing thing that you had against your spirit, because I told you who. A little boy came home from church one day. He said, hey, Daddy, how tall is Jesus? He said, I ain't got no idea what difference does it make. He said, it makes a big difference. How tall is Jesus? He said, I don't know, like six foot tall. He said, well, I'm 10 years old. How tall am I? He said, I'm four and a half foot tall. What difference does it make? He said, Daddy, think about this. If I'm four and a half foot tall and Jesus is six foot tall and Jesus lives inside me, he's going to stick out, ain't he? Amen. Church service. You need peace in this church service. Out. Out. 
For some of you, in order to get that peace, you're going to have to forgive the person that right now has been painted in your mind by the Holy Spirit that you don't want to forgive. The person you don't want to forgive is the first one you want to forgive. Come on. Come on. Yes. You know, it took me a long time. I'm just chit-chatting. It took me a long time. It took me a long time to even remember some things that happened to me when I was 12 and 13 that I buried on purpose. Until a prophet came to our church. He began to pray over me and he began to say things over me that I had buried for a very, very long time. And I had to come to grips with the reality that until I was willing to forgive the person that mismanaged me and hurt me and blessed me and harmed me and bruised me until I got to a place. And this was, we're talking three years ago now. I was 45 years old, I've buried that stuff since I was 12. Wow. Come on. Right? Yeah. Six kids, grandkids, the whole deal. Big church, books, movies, all that. Okay? Buried that stuff. And I knew at that moment when that prophet spoke over me, if I was ever going to get peace, I was going to have to let go of the stuff that was keeping me from having that peace. That's right. Just like some of you in this room. That's right. So my admonition to you is simply this. For some of you, the most radical form of deliverance you're ever going to receive is when you hit your knees tonight and you say, God, I need to know who I am in Jesus. Give me my identity back. I forgive my parents. I forgive myself. I forgive my ex. I, I forgive all of these people that hurt me and miss me. I forgive that Paul day that went wrong, right? I, I forgive the coach that embarrassed me and set me on the bench. I forgive that pastor that took advantage of me or kicked me out of that church. I forgive, I forgive. And when you do that, you'll get the peace that you've been searching for. Because some of you are in this room tonight and you don't even know who you are. Not because you're a bad person, but because you want to know how can I have peace? And God says, I need to speak identity in you. Amen. And some of you have lost the identity of who you are and what you struggle with. So right now, all over this room, I want you to stand to your feet. I don't have to do one of these heads bowed, eyes closed. This is a public church right here. Some of you right now, sir, ma'am, as an individual, as a couple, young, old, the like, some of you ought to come and hit your knees and say, God, right now, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would give me my identity back. Lord, tonight, help me to overcome this addiction. Help